from an initial group of about 12 people in the summer of 2012 to 323 as of today. We're on track to hit uh, almost 100% manning uh, in December of 14, right on time for FOC. FOC, full operational capability? FOC is full operational capability and the NATO requirement is number one, at least 90% manning and then uh, SHAPE, our Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe, our higher headquarters, laid out other criteria uh, that involved the ability to deploy, uh, the ability to manage certain land functions. We've met all the criteria, but I think the exercise we're undertaking now at, at the end of this year will be the final piece by which then Commander Allied Land Command could declare to SACUR, General Breedlove, that we've achieved full operational capability. In recent months, training exercises have been dramatically expanded and grown to a number of nations. Is this in response to events in the Ukraine? Actually, the Alliance and the nations have always had a robust training schedule. I think what's different is that the uh, Russian aggression uh, and the determination of the Alliance to assure our allies and to deter further Russian aggression um, has improved the synchronization of these exercises. So for example, uh, the U.S. Army's Sabre Junction exercise uh, was reconfigured and put under a NATO banner of Steadfast Javelin, which expanded participation and actually broadened the uh, impact. What does that mean when you say an exercise has moved from the U.S. or UCOM to NATO? It's important to remember that we are going to fight and operate as a multinational formation. I mean, look at what our president's been doing the last six months. He's been working on getting coalition together to deal with ISIL, and he's been working on a coalition to encourage the alliance to deter further Russian aggression and assure our allies. Our job is to make sure that uh, those units can be interoperable. So when you take a U.S.-led exercise and put it under a NATO headquarters, then uh, you have the opportunity to improve interoperability within the alliance. I hear that word being used a lot, interoperability. How do you define interoperability? Interoperability, the, the I word, gets used a lot uh, by the nations, by political leaders. Everybody recognizes it's important, but I don't think it's been adequately defined to the point that then you can actually do something meaningful with it. So at Land Command, uh, we've offered a definition uh, and some specificity for what interoperability means. It really consists of two pillars. The first pillar is a common set of standards, procedures, so that no matter what country you're from, this is how orders are going to be given, this is how reports are going to be given, this is how you're going to call for med uh, medical evacuation or fire support, do logistics. The second pillar is interoperability of communications and information systems. But that's been a goal for more than a decade, going back to Iraq and Afghanistan. Since I was a lieutenant in 1981, people have talked about it. Um, but we haven't actually forced it through because it, it starts banging into national systems. So that's why we've tried to add some specificity that um, would allow us to show are we making success or not. The first one is uh, tactical communications, FM radios need to be interoperable inside a tactical formation. So if you take an American company and put it under an Estonian battalion, they both have Harris radios, but yet they couldn't talk to each other because you had different communication security uh, programs in it that would not allow it. So that's a disconnect between a, a policy about protecting uh, communications and a national uh, directive, but the president puts an American company under an Estonian battalion. The second part of this communications interoperability is friendly force tracking. Americans are all familiar with Blue Force Tracker. It's how you see yourself or you know where all your friendlies are. Well, obviously, if you have a multinational formation, you need all the other countries to show up on the screen as well. There are 13 different friendly force tracking systems in NATO. Technically, it's not that hard, but it will require some policy changes that would allow access to databases, and I believe that there are ways to uh, create gateways that allow this to happen. The third component of this, if you have a multinational formation, then the data for the subordinate unit must show up on the COP, the common operating picture of the next higher unit. Last year, you remember Steadfast Jazz in Poland? 
first time ever we had an American brigade that was given to the NATO Response Force. A wonderful brigade, Colonel Steve Gillen from 1st Cavalry Division uh, did a superb job. They were the first ones to do this. So he, his brigade is attached to the French Rapid Ration Corps. He's got an Estonian battalion under him and other nations. I said, Steve, how did you communicate with the, the French and the Estonians? He said, well, the French gave me their boxes and then I gave my boxes to the Estonians and that's how we did it. So it was, that was not interoperable. That was a great U.S. soldier figuring out how to solve a problem. Well, that's exactly how I did it when I was a lieutenant and I had a German squad attached to my platoon. We would just give them radios. So all the incredible work that's been done to give our American forces digital capability is diminished if we don't figure out how to make it interoperable. You talk about NATO standards. Are they radically different from national standards? Actually, most nations, most land forces tend to do things about the same way. So we're not talking about really extreme changes that anybody has to make, but there are enough differences that it slows down or hinders interoperability. Keep in mind, 28 nations in NATO, English, which is the official operational language or the language in the headquarters for NATO, English is the native language for only three NATO members, you know, United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. So for 25 of the 28 nations, they're having to translate everything, having common procedures that everybody understands, using the same acronyms. You know, it matters. Uh, naming conventions, um, that's important. If you're going to take a Polish brigade and put it under a German division, and there's going to be an American battalion under that Polish brigade, Everybody using the same procedures. You can see why it's important. And I think uh, what U.S. Army Europe has started doing under General Campbell, and General Odierno recognized this a couple of years ago and has encouraged this as well, is to make sure that U.S. forces in Europe and U.S. forces that come to Europe begin to adhere to the NATO standards, to use the same terminology, so that uh, it makes assimilation and multinational task organization much uh, simpler and makes it easier for our allies to do this. So let me understand, are they learning NATO standards when they come to Europe or in preparation to come over to Europe? I don't think we are where we need to be yet. Um, you know, the, the regionally aligned force concept that uh, the Army, General Odierno, um, has instituted to provide a force that meets the requirements of combatant commanders all around the world, goes to an NTC rotation, for example, to achieve a level of readiness before they, they come over. I think it's in everybody's interest that when they go through that NTC rotation that they are already getting familiar with NATO standards, that they're meeting uh, using NATO procedures, that they're already anticipating um, NATO communications systems. This is only the second year of the Regional Aligned Force in Europe uh, already. I've seen the increased awareness of CONUS-based commanders um, about this. So I feel pretty confident we'll, we'll get it there. But it also has got to happen here at the uh, at Grafenvir and Hohenfels, that as people come here to train, that we're not training Romanians and Slovenians and Czechs to be Americans, but we're training all of them, including the U.S. forces, to be part of a NATO organization. When nations come to train for exercises, do they bring their own equipment? Does NATO pay for it? Does it all come out of one pot? It depends a little bit on the type of exercise. For the NATO Response Force, which is the main exercise, has been the main NATO exercise each year, which means one of the nine corps gets the priority for um, all resources. So you, you can already see the problem. There's eight other corps that need to get training along the course of the year, so the nations are having to figure out how to do that themselves. For sure, uh, each nation, including our own, is always looking very closely at, you know, how are we spending our money? So one of the other things that Land Command is trying to do is by partnering with U.S. Army Europe uh, twice a year at the combined training conference uh, to look for ways to help all the nations and all the NATO headquarters uh, line up national exercises and NATO exercises to look where there are um, synergies, efficiencies, 
where you can add on to someone else's exercises because everybody always needs a high con. They always need response cells. With Lancom now as the partner with U.S. Army Europe, I think this is really going to take off. At the last one, there were 37 nations showed up for this uh, conference just to figure out what exercises are out there. We're going to push that planning horizon out about three years, which is what every nation has said. We need more time because particularly smaller nations, their budget cannot accommodate last minute, hey, just come join our exercise. Mm -hmm. So I think the CTC, which is at Ober Amergau twice a year, um, is really going to uh, help. So let's bring it forward to present day. NATO has announced the creation of a very high value joint task force, a spearhead. What will be LANCOM's involvement in this? Uh, the Whale Summit showed, I think, that the nations of the alliance are, are serious about their purpose, are serious about their mission, uh, and certainly are serious about deterring further Russian aggression. It was very compelling to me that they came out so strong out of Wales, uh, talking about illegal Russian annexation in Crimea, Russian aggression. Uh, this is strong language. Um, the very high readiness task force, VJTF. It will be a land-centric formation, um, joint capabilities, that would be used on very short notice by the Supreme Allied Commander to be able to go do an exercise somewhere to show a presence um, and to show a capability that the alliance is serious if we see something happening on the other side of, uh, of NATO's boundary, if you will. There are uh, very, uh, I think, uh, a robust and sophisticated effort underway being led by SHAPE our higher headquarters to pull together what should this thing actually look like? What's the, com what's the command and control arrangement? Uh, the political guidance is we want to have a capability that's ready, very responsive, that can assemble in two to six days somewhere in Northern Europe, Central Europe, Southeastern Europe uh, to reassure allies or to deter aggression. And as I understand it, it's going to be some 4,000 troops? You heard numbers coming out, but again, that was, that was early speculation. I imagine the ultimate organization will probably be somewhere in that sort of size because if it becomes too big, then you have a difficulty with rapidly assembling somewhere. And, and of course, as always, this is an alliance. You know, what are the nations willing to pay for? And to be a very high readiness force, you have got to practice readiness, which means you've got to be willing to spend the money to practice assembling and showing up somewhere in Poland or uh, Lithuania or Hungary or Romania. So there's 27 land forces in NATO, 23 in LANCOM. That means 23 different national flavors. How do you make them all fight together? You're right. Uh, 28 nations in NATO, 27 of those nations have land forces. So we've got 23 of the 27 nations have land forces represented in our headquarters. Plus, we have an officer from Azerbaijan, and I'm anticipating officers coming from other PFP, Partnership for Peace Nations, coming within the next year as well, because these armies see the value of the headquarters and they want to be a part of it. When you've got that many nations involved, you've got a lot of different personalities, cultures, and histories. But NATO was the most successful alliance in the history of the world. I mean, since it was conceived at, after World War II, it has... Uh, accomplished the mission it was given, which primarily, Article 5, collective defense, an attack on one is an attack on all. We have not failed that mission. Uh, that's incredible. I mean, pick 23 or 25 of your closest friends or your closest family members and try and get them to agree on their favorite restaurant, their favorite movie, their favorite team. It's not going to happen. So to get 28 nations to agree on spending zillions of euro to possibly commit young men and women into combat or some sort of operation, that's a challenge. But when you get it, it is so powerful. At Land Command, I love the international environment. Um, the fact that we've got British, Turkish, German, Spanish, Polish, Italian, uh, Lithuanian, Greek, it, it makes it fun. And what I discovered how it, is how experienced almost all of them are. I would say probably 95% of the officers in our headquarters have been to Iraq and or Afghanistan and or Kosovo. Uh, most of the Europeans have served in UN missions uh, in Lebanon or Africa. That's why I want so many Americans to get the experience in Europe to, to meet 
these men and women and maybe gain a better appreciation for what this alliance is all about, why American leadership is important in the alliance. If NATO was called to an Article 5 situation, an attack on one is an attack on all, are the ground forces, the land forces, are they ready? LANCOM, we, we are in the middle of our train up. We're moving towards full operational capability. Just like any military organization, uh, we have a lot to do to continue to improve and grow. But if General Breedlove called me up today and said, hey, I need you to get your headquarters to Poland and get established right now, we would get that done. We've got enough talented, experienced officers and non-commissioned officers and NATO civilians that we could do it. It'd be a little bit ugly uh, getting established uh, for the first time, but could we do it? Absolutely. Land forces of the Alliance, the level of experience, the level of uh, really good equipment, I am very confident that we could do what we would have to do. The, the trick is that the Russians are not going to do us the favor of lining up on a road in a column of tanks and attack into Poland or uh, Estonia. Uh, and when I say the favor, it'd be because it'd be easy to target, it'd be easy to identify. Uh, what they have shown in the last year is uh, what some people refer to as hybrid warfare. It really is ambiguous warfare. They manage to stay below the level of what's an obvious Article 5, but they use uh, cyber information, uh, the, even the, the thing it seems a little silly of the little green men you know, the fact is it's not obviously Russian soldiers in many cases. And so to get 28 nations to agree to do something begins, becomes a little bit more of a challenge. I think the way the Russians have um, used, they've twisted the interpretation of a lot of legal documents and uh, conventions to achieve leverage as well. For example, the Russian government just passed a law that said the dis dissolution of the Soviet Union into Russia was illegal, so things that were, that were done back then are invalid. So in 1990, 1991, when the new Lithuanian government said, hey, look, I know this year 70,000 of you should be reporting for duty to join the Soviet Army. It's dissolving. We're not going to do that, so do not report. Well, now with this new interpretation, Russia considers those 70,000 young men, Lithuanians, as draft dodgers, and so they, in, they intend to arrest them if they ever get the opportunity. The, uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea, if not challenged, now shifts the boundaries of international waters and uh, exclusion zones, which affects what can happen in the Black Sea. These are all indicators now that I think all of us are much more attuned to uh, than we were a year ago. So is LANCOM ready for that? We're much more ready now than we were six months ago. Are land forces ready for that? Absolutely. We're much more attuned to how Russia might attempt to uh, exert influence. This is a European challenge was taking place in Russia. Uh, this is their backyard. Why do they continue to look to the U.S. for the lead? Well, first of all, there's, there's no downside to that. I mean, the United States has been in, the, uh, in this most successful alliance in the history of the world from the beginning. Um, the biggest economic block in the world, nothing comes close, is the European North American economic bloc. Whatever the different uh, agreements are and so on, but the amount of trade and interaction between Europe and North America dwarfs anything in the Pacific, South America, Asia, anywhere else. So for that reason alone, stability in Europe is vital to American economic uh, progress and stability for just that reason alone. Secondly, you're talking about all the leading or most of the leading democracies in the world are also members of the alliance. So there's a, a set of common shared values. Is it perfect? Is it perfect harmony? Of course not. But when you think about what we all sort of care for, there's a, there's a common uh, set of values that uh, I think is unique to uh, the members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Every member of NATO at some point in the history has fought against 
other members of NATO. I mean, Germans and French are obvious, Turks and Greeks. The United States has had two wars with the UK. We've had a war with Canada. I mean, that's, and yet now we're all in the alliance together. I, I don't want to sugarcoat this or uh, diminish the challenges of it, but it's to our advantage. And by the way, the size of the U.S. Army, for example, in Europe is now down to just below where it's getting down to below 30,000. It was well over 200,000 when I was a lieutenant. We don't need 200,000 anymore. But those 30,000 American soldiers and the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy and Marine Corps that are also in Europe um, represent a commitment by the United States to the stability of Europe, which is to our advantage. Uh, our national security strategy now is based more on power projection from CONUS rather than forward stationed, which means we have to have access. And if you don't have Ramstein Air Force Base, Interlake Air Force Base, port uh, access in Italy and Spain and, and Greece, um, then you cannot project power. So it's essential for the way that we have chosen to defend ourselves in that regard as well. Okay, I understand that, but the question is, why do they continue to look to the U.S. for the lead? Part of it is the, the amount of capability the United States has. Even if every nation in Europe was spending three, four, five percent of their GDP on defense, would never come to that sort of scale that the U.S. has. So there's a there's a respect for U.S. capability that that the uh, that our allies have. I think if the U.S. through airlift or um, training centers, um, intelligence. Logistics, nobody does big logistics like the United States. If we provide that to enable um, Poles and Germans and Brits and French and uh, Lithuanians to continue to uh, do their part, I, I don't see the downside of that. You are soon to become the commanding general for U.S. Army Europe. What wisdom will you take with you from your time here at Land Forces Command? The, the last two years as the commander of Land Command um, has been one of the most satisfying and hardest jobs I've ever had. Difficult because we started from almost zero and have, have had to grow and, and uh, you know, to build something new, but that was, you know, you can see how that would be a satisfying thing as well. I've gained a, a whole new respect for what the different nations provide. You know, what a Turkish soldier, why, why he is so proud of being a Turkish soldier or a British soldier or a, a Lithuanian soldier. So that is something that I want to make sure in U.S. Army Europe that U.S. Army Europe values its role within the alliance, that it's not a, an American island that focuses only on Title X things, but instead it has a duty and an opportunity to uh, contribute to this most successful alliance in the history of the world. So that's, uh, that's what I'm going to take with me. Uh, and from a practical standpoint, as well as personal satisfaction, the relationships I've built with the heads of the armies from all over Europe, NATO as well as partner nations. These are the same men that I'll be working with here over the next two years, so I think that's going to help. I'm really happy that the guy that's going to replace me at LANCOM is General Mick Nicholson, currently the commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, probably has as much international experience as any Army general today. He's excited about coming to LANCOM, and so I think the partnership between U.S. Army Europe and LANCOM is going to be very strong and will help make sure that NATO's land forces are effective and interoperable to include the U.S.